Maybe we'll give one more minute, 5.33, we'll, uh, we'll kick off. Um, do we have to let everybody in, Eric? Like so so no, so, so folks who are, you know, the members of the committee and, and folks who are staff and, and gonna be presenting are, are in as panelists. I see a number of, uh, of attendees who are, you know, sort of for members of the public who are joining us. Mm -hmm. uh, some other, I see some other folks on, on, from the staff who are not uh, going to be presenting who are here as attendees. Okay, I'm, I didn't caught into the two different categories, sorry. <laughs> Yeah, there's different terminology depending on which platform you're. Uh... So we were we're at five thirty three, and, and perhaps we can uh, we can kick off. Um, so I just want to just to just to start off, want to want to welcome uh, Campaign Finance Board Chair Rick Schaefer, who will be chairing this meeting uh, for us, um, and we'll hear introductory remarks from him. Um, if if folks on the on the committee would like to uh, to welcome folks afterwards, uh, please uh, please take the time. But but Rick, take it away. Uh, thank you, Eric. Uh, so good evening and welcome to the February 2021 meeting of the Campaign Finance Board's Voter Assistance Advisory Committee. The theme of tonight's meeting is Ranked Choice Voting, the new voting method for city elections that allows voters to rank up to five candidates in order of preference. We'll review the experience so far with Ranked Choice Voting in two city council special elections where it has been used this month. Voters in City Council District 24 were the first on February 2nd, and voters in City Council District 31 finished casting their ballots yesterday on February 23rd. NYC Votes launched a voter education campaign on ranked choice voting in early January. We'll hear more detail about our voter education activities shortly, but I want to summarize them for you right at the top. So far, NYC Votes staff have produced digital materials for our website and social media, including FAQs and digital toolkits. Those have all been translated into Spanish, Chinese, Korean, and Bengali. We are encouraging our community partners to use these materials in reaching their constituents. In addition, we've mailed postcards to all voters in the special election districts, alerting them to the change to rank choice voting with instructions on casting a ballot that counts. We've held more than 40 training sessions about ranked choice voting and have conducted sessions at community boards and other civic events aimed at voters and what they can expect when they voted by a ranked choice ballot for the first time. We'll hear more about those later in the meeting. These events have all been offered to the public for free and there will be many more in the coming weeks and months. We encourage anyone who is interested in helping more New Yorkers prepare for ranked choice voting to sign up for a training on the CFB website as soon as possible. Later this spring, we'll launch an extensive advertising campaign. The campaign will include an animated video explaining the process from the voters point of view, and we're planning to hear an update on that work as well. Our primary election voter guide will feature ranked choice voting content in both the print and online editions. NYC Votes is working hard to make sure New Yorkers are fully prepared to cast a ranked choice ballot in 2021. There is more to come, so stay tuned to NYC Votes on social media to keep track of the latest updates. I will now turn to Amy Lopez for her report. Uh, thank you very much. Um, thank you all for joining us tonight. Uh, as the chair Schaefer mentioned, uh, I am Amy Lopez. I'm the executive director of the New York City Campaign Finance Board. And I'd like to begin by first acknowledging that tonight's meeting is the first since 2017 that we are, I'm sorry, I, my, my computer is unstable. I don't know why my video just stopped all of a sudden. Um, 
this this is the first meeting we are not joined by our former VAC chair, Naomi Zatterer. Uh, Naomi's time on VAC has come to an end and we are thankful for her service. Naomi worked tirelessly to advocate for lasting voting reform for all New Yorkers during her three plus years on VAC and we thank her for her service and dedication. Uh, as the campaign finance board work is well underway for the 2021 election cycle, last week the CFB approved $18,660,290 in public matching funds payments to 124 candidates. Two candidates for mayor, three candidates for controller, 12 candidates for borough president, and 107 city council candidates received public funds. The CFB has paid a total of more than $38 million to candidates in the 2021 elections thus far in the election cycle, including previous payments in December and January. To date, 147 candidates have received public funds payments. The next opportunity for candidates to receive public funds is March 15th. I will now turn it over to Eric Friedman, our ex Assistant Executive Director for Public Affairs, to provide a brief update on the work that our Public Affairs Unit and discuss the recent special elections with Jews ranked choice voting. So thank you, Amy. So before I, I kind of give a little overview of, of, of some of the work uh, in, in public affairs, I wanna, I see um, members of the committee here. Uh, we have Christopher Malone, Mazeda, we have Jamela Rose representing the, the Public Advocates Office. If, if you guys have any um, kind of opening or welcome remarks, I wanna give you an opportunity before I, I kick things off. Sure, I'll go first, Eric. Good evening, everyone. I'm Christopher Malone. Uh, uh, my day job is Dean of the School of Arts and Sciences at Malloy College, which is in Rockville Center, right over the border of, of Queens. Uh, I'm a political scientist by training. I was appointed to the VAC last April by Mayor de Blasio. And, and I'll say that last year was really eventful in many respects, but certainly for this committee and for the CFB, guiding us through uh, in the Board of Elections, guiding us through uh, our first virtual uh, set of elections. Uh, early voting in the fall really ramped up and uh, our previous meetings last year really focused on the, the good, the bad and the ugly from all of those things last year. And now we quickly turn to the next big thing in New York City, which is ranked choice voting. And we're really excited about that, I think we've done a great job, the city's done a great job of starting to um, educate the citizenry about what it is. And I look forward to the conversation tonight and going forward to make sure that this is the most effective way that we can uh, get people to participate in our democracy. So thanks. And hi, just wanted to add also, um, good evening, everyone. I'm Jamela Rose, Deputy Public Advocate of Civic and Community Empowerment, and I also sit um, in place of the Public Advocate on the VAC. So just wanted to say, um, you know, we know that this will be the first time that, you know, the tabulation process will be happening, and that we'll have lots of discussion tonight about our CV, Ranked Choice Voting in New York City. So really looking forward to hearing the feedback from the various panelists, and um, we're listening and willing to help where needed. Uh, well, well, thank you guys. Um, so I'm going to keep my remarks pretty brief. Um, uh, we're going to hear in, in a few minutes, I'm going to turn to, um, to Ali Swatsek, who's our Director of Policy and Research, and, and, and she uh, will talk in some depth about, um, about the work that we are doing to communicate with the voters all over uh, the, the city around, about ranked choice voting, starting with these special elections that we've had here in February uh, out in Queens, um, the ones coming up next more, uh, next month, really soon up in the Bronx. And certainly as we get closer and closer to that big citywide primary um, in June, um, we're gonna hear a little bit also from Mitchell Cohen, who is uh, our content strategy manager in uh, our, our marketing and digital communications unit. And he's gonna talk about some of uh, the materials that we, that we will be preparing uh, that you folks will be seeing very soon um, that we will be getting out in front of voters um, uh, in preparation to do their ranking. Um, and Eve Grassfield from uh, Democracy NYC um, will come and talk about some of the work that uh, that, that they are doing uh, 
in the administration to kind of help support this, this really critical, crucial voter education effort. Um, we will be uh, turning after that discussion to a look at the legislative session in Albany. And um, we'll return to Ali and she, she will talk a bit about um, some of the recommendations that we are putting together um, to the state legislature uh, to help improve election administration in New York City around the state. Um, we're we're going to hear from Harry Grossman, who's with the New York Civil Liberties Union, and he will, will address the same subject. And we want to make sure that um, along the way, um, we are, take some time to, to stop and, and, and answer some questions. Um, we'll try to do that at the end of the, the ranked choice voting discussion. And then once more, as we get to that end of, of that, that election reform legislative discussion at the end. Um, before we start, there are just a couple of, of, of items that I do want to talk briefly about. First, um, later this week, uh, it's actually tomorrow night, uh, an event that I want to um, talk a little bit about. Um, we are co-sponsoring with, with BRIC uh, in Brooklyn, a, a town hall for future voters for young people in New York City, um, a mayoral forum uh, that will be held online remotely. Um, there are a number of mayoral candidates who uh, are committed to attend. Uh, Eric Adams, Sean Donovan, um, Carlos Machaca, uh, and a number of others who are on the ballot, uh, who, who are seeking the ballot for mayor. Um, and that will be tomorrow night. Um, that's being led by, by um, our public relations unit, Matt Sellers and Olivia Brady, who is our youth voter coordinator. Uh, we'll make sure that we'll get a link to, to more information uh, on that in the chat here so people can, can access it. Uh, and just the other thing I will mention that uh, we are kind of entering into right now, um, you know, that June election is is coming up very very quickly. Um, we have started to reach out to candidates to provide uh, information for us uh, for our voter guide that we will be preparing for that June election. Um, this will be what will uh, be for us a, a, a massive uh, unprecedented undertaking uh, in terms of the of the size of that of that guide with um, the number of candidates again seeking the ballot in this election. Uh, we are starting to hear from them. We are putting together information. Um, candidates will have the opportunity to record a short video that will go with uh, with their online voter guide profile. Uh, they will also be uh, in the print guide, which goes to every registered voter in New York City. Um, the material is prepared in all of the Voting Rights Act languages, um, translated to Spanish, Chinese, uh, Korean, and Bengali, um, in, in, in those last three in certain parts of the city. Um, so those, those submissions, we'll be taking submissions from candidates for the end of March, and then uh, our marketing and digital communications staff will be working with our candidate services folks to make sure that the guide is complete. Um, and, and we'll be putting that information together for, 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 for voters. It will contain plenty of information about, uh, about ranked choice um, and, and, and be a, a really fundamental part of the effort that we'll be making to ensure that voters have everything they need to vote with confidence this year. So I'm with that, I'm gonna conclude um, and I will look to Ali to start off our conversation on ranked choice voting and the work that we're doing. Thanks, Eric. Uh, my name is Ali Swadek. I'm the Director of Policy and Research at the Campaign Finance Board. Um, I have a couple of slides that turned into many slides to tell you about all of the work we've been doing um, related to voter education and outreach um, over the last couple of months. And I'm gonna share those screens now. Hopefully, can you give me a thumbs up if you're seeing the slides? Fantastic. Okay, so I've decided that there are five buckets for our voter education and outreach efforts. Um, so since the beginning of the new year, we have been incredibly busy actively educating New Yorkers about ranked choice voting. Um, we have primar primarily done that through five different outreach mechanisms. So. The first one is the Train the Trainer series, and this is targeted to community organizations to prepare them to be rank, a ranked choice voting expert and resource in their own community. The second is voter trainings, which are targeted to voters to cover 
all the basics about ring choice voting in New York City. The third is panels and events, which is a way of getting the word out and generating leads for our voter trainings. Um, and the fourth method of media coverage basically um, serves the same purpose. And it's a way of getting ourselves out there, making sure that the information that is being conveyed about ranked choice voting is correct. And then the fifth is direct outreach. And so one example of that is the texting uh, direct to voters in special election districts that we've been doing through the through text platform. And then I'll also um, segue off to Mitchell to talk about the direct communications um, we've been doing on social media and through the mail. So just to go over the train the trainer and what that is, it's a more advanced and detailed training. It's about an hour long and it's intended for community organizations who be doing voter outreach in their communities. And you'll be able to take away a lot of information from the train the trainer. Um, you'll know why we're using ring choice voting, how ring choice voting works, um, what are the key takeaways for voters, but then you'll also understand best practices for educating and communicating with voters about ring choice voting. Um, so we, um, I wanna thank the two members of my team who have helped stand this up, Jordan Pantalone and Luigi Claude, as well as Amanda and Eric for, um, for joining me on the trainer route. And we do these twice a week. So it's a pretty large undertaking. Um, we started our inaugural training on January 6th. There have been two trainings every week in January and February. We've had a total of 25 trainings to which we've had um, 427 attendees. So you can go to our website to sign up for these trainings. It's at www.nycacfb.info slash RCV training. Um, one of the most successful ways that we have found to generate interest in our trainings is through partnering with elected officials and other community partners. So our first two train the trainers um, were meant to, we wanted to start out by focusing on the Queens Special Elections Districts. So we worked in partnership with Assemblywoman Nellie Rosick's office, as well as Chaya India Home, South Asian Council for Social Services, and Women for Afghan Women, um, who all have active, um, act, active spaces in the Queens Council District 24 space. So we had 150 attendees based off of promoting this train the trainer and this was our first two ones that were January 6th and January 7th. Um, another uh, way that we've generated uh, a lot of interest in our train the trainers is by again partnering with community organizations. We worked with uh, Disability Rights New York and Hispanic Federation and we co-sponsored this training with the City Board of Elections for um, voters with disabilities. So Ariel Mer Merkel, who is the ADA coordinator at the BOE, um, basically joined me in a train the trainer and demonstrated what ranked choice voting looks like on the auto mark ballot marking device. Um, so this, we had 40 attendees, but we've also had 95 additional views on YouTube. So that's another way that we've been generating interest in what, um, what we do. And we've been asked as a result of this training to present at a number of events for voters with disabilities. So it's been a great lead generator as well. Um, and looking forward, um, we wanna continue this model. So we're working with the Hispanic Federation to train their partner organizations on March 4th. On March 17th, April 13th, May 11th, um, the Partnerships and Outreach team are doing a train the trainer for Faith in New York, Queens, Manhattan, and Staten Island. So very exciting. Um, this is in addition to our regular train the trainers, which will occur on a weekly basis as well going forward. Um, and then really excitingly, we have a train the trainer that is focused on youth. So our youth engagement coordinator, Olivia Brady, took our train the trainer and incorporated it to be youth facing. Um, and I included a sample of my favorite page, which is really fun and colorful. Um, these youth RCV trainings began on February 23rd. She had 25 attendees, which is, which is kind of incredible because most of these uh, young people can't even vote. They just wanna learn about it so that they can tell their parents and you know, their siblings that can vote about it. Um, and going forward, we're gonna have one of these every month. Okay, the second method of outreach and education is direct to voter trainings. So these are a little bit shorter, sorry, these are significantly shorter than our train the trainers, um, but they also cover everything a voter would need to know about ranked choice voting. So 
um, why we're using it, how to correctly cast your ballot, how winners are decided, and the reasons that you want to rank candidates. And we think this is really important. So the policy and research team and the partnerships and outreach team led by Omar Suarez have done a fantastic job of getting to as many voters as possible this way. Um, we've had a total of 43 events with, uh, I think it's a little bit more than 2,400 attendees. Um, partnerships and outreach has gone to pretty much every Queens Community Board, with, which overlaps with the Special Elections District um, in uh, Districts 24 and 31, and that meant speaking to 284 community members of those boards. This was really successful for us, and we plan on replicating it in the Bronx throughout March. So our voter trainings, we've also found enormous success partnering with elected officials. So we partnered with Queens BP Donovan Richards, the Civic Engagement Commission and Democracy NYC for two voter facing trainings in Queens um, on January 19th and January 26th. We had around 300 attendees for, uh, for both of these. And uh, now our efforts are turning towards the Bronx as well. So on February 10th, we had a Facebook Live event with Council Member Vanessa Gibson and the Stonewall Community Development Corporation. Um, we had 406 attendees or viewers and um, another event on February 17th with Assemblywoman Alicia Hinman um, and Assembly District 29 partners also had around 400 attendees or viewers on Facebook Live. Um, so we found that Facebook Live is actually a really good way of reaching a bunch of voters at once. Um, the video we're streaming onto Facebook Live right now, of course, we understand the value of that here too, I think. Um, but the cool thing about it is it stays, um, the video stays on the person's site. So we actually did a, an incredibly successful youth outreach on January 13th. Um, it was a Facebook Live stream with Why Vote the Department of Youth and Community Development, and again, led by Olivia Brady, and there were almost 450 attendees or viewers. Okay, as, as I repeated, looking forward, we're going to continue these successful partnership model with other elected and key community partners. So looking forward to the Bronx on March 9th and March 11th, we are doing trainings in partnership with the Bronx BP's office. On March 16th and March 18th, we are having Spanish language trainings in partnership with Naleo, Dominicanos USA, and the Bronx BP's office, which we're really, really excited about. Okay, the third method of voter education and outreach, which we find to be really helpful for generating leads for our voter trainings, is panels and events, which um, they're a little bit different than trainings because we get to deliver a really short bit of information about ranked choice voting or voting in general, but once people know that we can give trainings, which we always tell people in these panels, we frequently get um, emails or interest and invitations to other events. So these three past events that we went to with Abney, City and State, and the Staten Island North Shore Dems um, had over 350 viewers, which led to additional voter training opportunities as well. So again, looking forward, we're hoping to replicate the success of that by appearing basically everywhere we are invited to. So we are going to be appearing at a panel with the Bronx chapter of Jack and Jill on an RCB panel with the Fund for the City of New York and other organizations and a candidate forum in City Council District 1 that's sponsored by APA Voice. Okay, and I'm kind of shoehorning this in this section. <laughs> because I wanted to make sure to highlight our work here. Um, we also meet every two weeks with the New York City Elections Consortium Ranked Choice Voting Working Group. Um, we've been meeting since December 1st. It's a mix of advocacy and community groups, government, and even elected official staff. Um, and we're using this as a sounding board for policy communications and outreach ideas related to ranked choice voting. Um, and I wanted to make sure to highlight our work here and. I think Eve Grassfield from Democracy NYC may also talk about this a little bit more, um, but we're really proud of the work we're doing here. And we think it's a really important resource for um, generating ideas and generating, again, leads for additional voter um, trainings. Okay, our fourth method of outreach is media coverage. And this is a very busy page, so um, don't worry. But um, our public relations team led by Matt Sollers does a fantastic job of getting us a lot of media coverage. Um, and that doesn't just mean um, the facts of ranked choice voting are being reported out correctly, but we're constantly reiterating that we do trainings. You should go to our website. Um, and 
we make sure that everyone knows that we're doing that for the people who are reading these um, blogs and news articles. So we've had coverage in the city, city and state, Norwood News, City uh, Brooklyn Reader, the Queens Daily Eagle, Politico, the New York Daily News, AM New York, and El Diario, among many others. Um, and we're also focusing on media coverage that doesn't just highlight our train the trainers and voter presentations, um, but is focusing on the fact that there's a municipal election happening this year and that there are a lot of different organizations that are working on um, making sure that people know about ranked choice voting. Okay, and last but not least, we're showing up on radio, on TV, and on podcasts. Um, on January 12th, we were on a live broadcast of the WAMU 1A production. Um, I appeared on Bronx Talk, which was really exciting, on February 15th. And in the future, we also recorded an episode of Closed Captioning Podcast from Empire State of Rights that focuses on how um, voters with disabilities can get information about ranked choice voting. So it's really exciting. Ooh, sorry, I'm losing my voice. <laughs> okay, and then the last um, piece of voter education and outreach that we do is direct outreach to voters. And one of those ways is through text banking via through text. So for the Queen's special elections, we reached out to 24,000 voters in District 24, 36,000 voters in District 31, and for the Bronx special elections that are coming up on March 6th, we are reaching out to around 60,000 voters combined for Districts 11 and 15. Um, and we're able to do that because we have over 40 amazing volunteers that will join us on the weekend to text people um, through using through text, which is really exciting. Um, and with their help, we're able to reach about 140,000 voters in those special election districts. Okay, and then of, co of course, another method of direct outreach is communication and social media. So this is the perfect segue to Mitchell. <laughs> I'll stop sharing my screen. Thank you, Ali. That was the perfect segue. Um, so I will share my screen. All right, can everybody see that okay? All right, perfect. So I'm gonna talk through some of the education materials that we've created for ranked choice voting um, across print and digital. So first of all, just to talk through our approach, our goal is to provide voter-centric language that's really grounded in research. So for all of our materials, we're making sure that we're not just broadly speaking about what ranked choice voting is, but talking directly to voters to really answer that specific question of what do I need to know about it? Um, so before we really went into creating any of these materials, we conducted a lot of research. We worked with the Center for Civic Design who um, has been spending years researching uh, education materials on ranked choice voting um, and worked with them on testing specific education materials um, with New York City voters. So we were able to take um, findings from their research and best practices and then feedback directly from um, New York voters um, incorporate that into our materials. And we also um, researched other cities and municipalities that have implemented ranked choice voting. So we looked into specifically what materials they created or the outcomes of their campaigns and then spoke to election administrators to learn more about their experience of what went well, what questions popped up from voters and um, kind of any advice they'd share along the way. So with all of that, we adopted a um, model from the Center for Civic Design, um, which they call Bite Snack Meal, um, which is really just three different levels of information, bites being the most basics, snacks being a medium amount of information, um, and meals being the most detailed amount of information for voters who really need um, and want um, as much info as possible. So I'm gonna walk you through kind of using that model, each of the different materials that we've created to um, which we've shared ourselves and we've also um, made available to partners um, throughout the city. So the first thing that we worked on is a postcard, um, which is something we worked really closely on with the Center for Civic Design. Um, there's a few components in here um, that based on their findings we found to be really important that we've also incorporated across um, all the other materials that I'm going to preview. So to highlight a few of those things, one is providing a clear um, visual example of a sample ballot, of what does it look like to fill that out correctly, um, as well as visual examples of what not to do based on common questions and um, common mistakes that voters could make. 
Um, another is really clear, simple step-by-step -step instructions, how to fill out your ballot. Um, and then third is to really provide context or information of where to get more information if you want it, particularly in other languages. Um, so one thing we were really excited about from the Center for Civic Design's findings is that for voters who viewed a postcard with this level of information, they found that nearly half of them felt that they were comfortable um, going to vote in a ranked choice voting election after that, which is something that we were really excited to find. Um, so this is a postcard that we you can see here was tailored to the first special election. Um, and we've sent out versions um, of this to every registered voter in districts 24 and 31. And we are at the, the next couple of days, um, they should be hitting the mailboxes um, to voters in districts 11 and 15. So the next material kind of in the bite category um, are flyers. Um, so this is a flyer um, in Chinese where we, if, expanded very slightly on the information in the postcard, quite a bit more information, but still kind of at that um, general bite size information. So these are flyers that we've created that are available um, in Chinese, Bengali, Korean, and Spanish. So the final type of material in the initial bite category are our social media posts. Um, so this is, these are examples from a series of slides um, created explaining um, what do I need to know? Um, to provide a general preview of ranked choice voting. This is a series of uh, eight slides we've created on this topic. Um, we've also created a series on how to fill out your ballot, which includes specific visual examples and then on how ballots will be counted with ranked choice voting. Um, these are also um, available in each of those five languages. So another thing that's really important that we found is just providing multiple points of entry. People learn, have different learning styles, um, have different um, ways that they like to receive information. Um, so you can see on our right, our incredible social media manager, Tori Mueller, who has worked on all of the social content. So she's been creating a series of um, videos on the over, on to provide an overview of ranked choice voting. Um, and has also been hosting along with our youth coordinator, Olivia Brady, um, live events on our social media channels, um, which are really great conversations on the topic and provide a chance to get feedback in real time from viewer questions. Um, of how they're receiving this information and kind of any other questions or concerns that they have. So finally, on social media, we've been partnering with uh, Democracy NYC and the Mayor's Public Engagement Unit to provide a social media toolkit. Um, so this is a toolkit that has the graphics that you've seen above, um, social media copy that has been translated into 12 languages um, and is ready to just share, just paste and share in your own channel um, at will. Um, so this is something that's been shared with other city agencies, with members of the elections consortium that um, Ali spoke about, partners and others. Um, so this is something that we found is um, been really excited to see um, examples of these posts um, showing up on social. So the next thing is the snack level of information, um, which is our ranked choice voting webpage at nyccfb.info slash rcv. So all the previous materials that um, I've just shared link to this webpage, which is where voters can find more information um, if they want it. So the goal of this page is just to answer really general questions. Why are we using ranked choice voting? Which elections will it be used in? How do I fill out my ballot? Um, and how will my vote be counted? Um, so you can see on the right, a small snippet of this page, and it goes into a bit more detail than what was on the postcard. It's a more fleshed out example of how not to fill out your ballot um, and slightly more detailed instructions. Um, and this web page has also been translated into Bengali, Chinese, Korean, and Spanish. So at the bottom of this page, we link to um, our final material, um, which is our FAQs page. Um, so this is what we consider the meal. This is the most detailed information and answers to the most specific questions. This is not information that we'd expect every voter to want or need, um, but want to make sure it's available for those who do. Um, so this is getting into questions of when to expect results, questions about write-in ballots. Um, and so this has also been translated into those five languages. So in the last piece, which we um, are very excited about, is coming for the next couple of weeks. It's an animated video about ranked choice voting, which is kind of in the snack category of information. So it's uh, going to explain the basics of why we're using RCV, the offices it's used in, how to fill your ballot, um, and then how your ballot will be counted. So we think that's just gonna be another really um, 
kind of a fun way of getting this information across. Um, that's also going to be available um, in uh, Bengali, Chinese, Korean, and Spanish. So keep your eyes out. We are very excited to share that soon. And I will stop sharing. Awesome, awesome. I want to thank uh, Mitchell and Ali for, for putting, uh, putting that together and, and, and really giving folks a flavor of, of, of the tremendous work that they uh, and their colleagues have been doing and the exciting things we have coming up. Um, I want to invite Eve Grassfield from Democracy NYC um, to, to present. You know, they've been great partners of ours as we've embarked on this, on this journey. Um, you know, uh, Ali mentioned the, the consortium work that we've done to kind of communicate out to um, organizations all around the city and enlist them in this effort. And um, the Democracy NYC team have, have been great partners to us in that. Um, so Eve, um, please. Yeah, thanks so much, Eric. Um, my Zoom is yelling at me that I have unstable connection. So I'm going to say hello on video and then I'm going to turn off my video and talk. So I'm sorry that I'm speaking to you from the void, but very happy to see you all tonight and excited to talk about our work. Um, so as Eric said, I'm Eve Grassfield. I'm a policy advisor at Democracy NYC, a city initiative tasked with increasing voter engagement, education and access across the five boroughs. Um, and as you know, that we have the new system of ranked choice voting, it's here. Um, we just finished the second ranked choice voting special election yesterday in Queens Council District 31 with two upcoming special elections in the Bronx on March 23rd. Um, Democracy NYC has hit the ground running educating voters on this new system by hosting many upcoming workshops as well as getting the word out through social media and phone banking. As we speak, Democracy NYC is hosting a Black History Month event with Medgar Evers College on ranked choice voting, the importance of municipal elections and the New York City COVID-19 test and trace effort. Um, and this is something I wanna emphasize that I think one thing is we're trying to get out information in lots of different ways, including um, amplifying the other resources, especially vaccine and testing resources that the city has currently. Um, additionally, we're hosting workshops in multiple languages, including workshops in Spanish, Bangla, and Urdu in the coming weeks. Um, for the past three months, we've been sending a monthly newsletter about these opportunities and educational materials to our 15,000 plus volunteer lists, as well as conducting outreach to community-based organizations. City agencies, including a lot of the folks on this call, are working collaboratively to educate voters about ranked choice voting and the importance of municipal elections in their language. The Campaign Finance Board, Civic Engagement Commission, Mayor's Office for Immigrant Affairs, and our team at Democracy NYC are working together to translate ranked choice voting educational materials into 12 plus languages, as well as working with community-based organizations on an online mock ballot tool that will allow organizations to create custom ballots in their language of choice. This tool will be translated into 14 languages and screen reader tested and will allow voters to test out the ranked choice voting ballot before heading to the polls by voting on things like their favorite New York City snack or park. Furthermore, Democracy NYC will be partnering with Brick Media to produce several PSAs and events prior to the June primary. Democracy NYC also continues to advance election reforms to make voting easier and more accessible for New Yorkers, including Board of Elections reforms, rights restoration for those on parole and other crucial legislation to expand access to voting in person early and by mail. We are committed to ensuring all New York City voters have access to our democratic process and look forward to the discussion on the ways we can work together with stakeholders to make sure all New York City voters have the information they need to exercise their right to vote. Um, thank you so much for including us in this presentation um, and look forward to the rest of the conversation. Thank you, Eve. Uh, really appreciate you being here and, and, and joining the conversation. Um, before we move ahead, I want to just take a minute to, to stop and see if um, members of the committee have any questions for our panelists for, uh, on, on ranked choice voting um, uh, to discuss. If folks or members of the public have questions like they'd like to type into the chat, um, you know, we'll try to address those here. Um, and, and, you know, if, if those come up as we go, you know, we'll make sure to address them uh, before we conclude at the end. But um, for members of the committee, uh, any questions for Ali Mitchell or Eve um, on on ranked choice voting effort? Eric, uh, I do very quickly for Ali. Um, thank you both for your, your pr presentations. Um, 
uh, Ali, you mentioned that you had reached out to tens of thousands of voters. Are those um, already registered voters? How are they chosen? Are they super double prime voters? What, what, you know, in, in the parlance of the registered voter, um, you know, lexicon, are these the, the most likely to vote? Are they the least likely to vote? How did we reach out to these folks? So this could be a disappointing answer, but it is all of the registered voters in those districts who we have their cell phone number. <laughs> okay. um, so not everybody provides a cell phone number when they register to vote um, or folks have been registered for so long that they didn't, uh, you know, it was pre cell phones in some cases. Mm -hmm. um, so you don't have to provide a cell phone. You just need to provide a telephone number. Um, so we text everybody whose contact information is available to us that is a cell phone. Okay. So it's voters from, you know, runs the gamut. I'm sure there's people who've never voted before, people who vote all the time. Um, but we've had, as a volunteer on the text banking days, we sort of had some interesting conver conversations with people that we text message. So that's always fun. Okay, thank you. Hey, the, the last, uh, to, just to follow up, so it's, I would imagine in one of these council districts, um, you know, th there's probably two or three, four or five times the number of registered voters than that. So that's the best way we can get to them. Is there a way that we can reach more um, registered voters? Um, so Mitchell described the mailings that we did to every registered voter household. Okay. Um, the Board of Elections also did a mailing. I think the folks in the special elections districts have potentially been inundated by mail um, <laughs> this go around because of COVID and the fact that mail is, is one of the safe ways of reaching out to people. Um, so from a what what total number of voters that represents for um, for District 24, we, t we texted about, I think it was 25,000 voters. There's 85,000 registered voters in that district. So it's a little bit more than uh, a fourth. Yeah, I would say for each district. Um, there, it is, it's not perfect, but we're given what we, uh, the resources that we have texting is a very economical way of reaching out to voters. We, we, I think have been going through our list on text banking days in a matter of hours. So you can do it very quickly. Folks respond. You can, um, have conversations throughout the week with them as they respond slowly, <laughs> even, or ask for more information. Great, thanks, appreciate it. There any other questions from the committee for uh, our panelists on ranked choice? Um, just a note for other folks who are here in the meeting, if you have questions that come up, um, there is the Q&A and chat functions in, in, in Zoom if you'd like to post a question there uh, and we'll return to those um, towards the end, um, I see a hand raised. Um, uh, Ms. Ada is in the attendees, and, and I see a, we'll, we'll look to Ms. Ada first, and I see Amy with her hand raised afterwards. Hello, thank you, everyone. Uh, long time, um, but finally, we are doing great job good work we are doing. We are trying our best. But a couple of issues I'm uh, concerning that uh, South Asian Bengali community needs uh, a lot of help, uh, which I already find out that uh, most of the women uh, uh, needs, uh, I think, a ranked choice vote uh, training in bilingual. Um, I think uh, that should be including Bengali media and then so that that will be helpful to uh, bring up the voters. District 24 vote was ranking choice uh, and I'm from the District 24. And I find out uh, that um, most of the people do not understand that ranking choice, they can be voted one person also. 
Okay, uh, that is a difficult issue which I was there and I saw, and uh, and I said that um, my thinking is that if we can properly train our voters, new voters, even though if we can train new voters, they can educate their parents. Okay, in their home, uh, that is that should be our first priority, uh, and uh, I think uh, Women Month is next month. I think we should be raising women voters matters. Uh, that should be a ranking choice. Uh, should be women can interesting. I think leading can be helpful to any women leaders to be choosing to lead them. That will be the best idea uh, to bringing women to ranking choice voting understand. If we can create one woman, I think uh, the, I'm not talking about an, uh, one district. If we can create a uh, voting teams uh, that leading teams, I think they can be helpful to speak in their language. I can speak, I can explain, but I'm a campaign finance back members, I should not do this kind of things to, I can involve, I can engage to others. That can be helpful uh, to bring in community front lines, number one. Number second, so many people keep calling to voter registration, which is uh, new voters. And uh, I think curbside voter registration can be only solution uh, to uh, bring voters to the, uh, to become a voters, uh, register voter, become a voters if we can curbside vote. Uh, registration drive and uh, that can be because uh, which you can uh, Amy thank you she's doing wonderful job and Ali and uh, Arik uh, um, everyone Amanda doing wonderful job but we can be more helpful to push more I, I know COVID-19 but still we can be more push uh, to register more voters and get you to be uh, educated ranking choice things because they will be become a voters anyhow when turn a, uh, 18 years old. That can be the solve. I think a better uh, um, constituent, I am thinking to uh, involve a Bengali, different media, uh, they can be educated, they can be spoke out. Uh, many times I requested to bring uh, multilingual uh, meters to the front lines and they are the masses, they are that uh, communication, collaboration, they can bring many leaders to the front lines. I, I want to thank you for those comments, Ms. Ada, all, all of which are, are really good and, and I think helpful uh, in terms of how we frame our work going forward. Um, I know there were a couple of hands. Amy, your hand was raised, and, and Jamila, I, I see your hand raised as well. Well, Ms. Ida, again, thank you for your comments, because I think that's important. I mean, one of, you know, that's, as, as I think that we've spoken about, one of the big focuses is on language, you know, uh, communities that language English is not their first language. It's definitely a focus of our all of our work, and in particular the ranked choice voting education, because again, it is you know that it's a uh, harder to reach communities and people who don't always get the information that they you know that they need to uh, to participate fully in the democracy. Um, I guess my building on something Mazita said about the uh, Council District Twenty Four and you know. Um, in 31, I was wondering if, you know, one of the comments that's been in the press and people have talked about is, you know, whether, you know, how are we going to judge whether ranked choice voting is successful? Like, what is our, what's going to be the measure? You know, what, what are we looking for? And what do we, can we, you know, I know it's very, very preliminary in these very first two elections. What can we, you know, say from the election that I mean, one is going on just finished yesterday, so we really don't know anything about it. But um, you know what we can know about the election that happened already. Um, I can I can jump in. I think so. One of the narratives that we found a little a little frustrating. I think I can speak for all of us on this is that um, the media was reporting District Twenty Four as not being a test of ring choice voting. Um, but voters ranked people on their ballots. So for voters, it was really important to have that experience for the first time um, of going into the ballot, um, going into poll sites and having their ballot be a ranked choice voting grid. So um, we don't have information right now on how many voters did rank 
Um, but we are actively trying to get that information. The Board of Elections is supposed to post um, a round by round breakdown of how many, um, how many voters voted for each candidate. Um, and that'll give us a sense of how many voters ranked. For District 31, um, which is being billed as the first test of ranked choice voting because nobody um, received greater than 50% of first choice votes yesterday. Um, there is, I think, greater interest in seeing the RCV tabulation rounds because the, there's anticipation that after the Board of Elections counts the first, all of the first choices on the absentee ballots over the course of the next two weeks, um, we will end up with a ranked choice voting tabulation, um, which we're excited to see. But I think the narrative that this is the first test of RCV is not correct for voters. Everybody who voted in District 24 had the opportunity to rank, same as everyone in District 31. Um, the only difference being that, of course, there wasn't an outright winner in the first round. Yeah, I think that's important for people to remember that people did vote and we'll, we'll learn how it works. And I think that, you know, one of the, I think in a previous meeting when we talked about this, we talked about, you know, really hoping that people that you just looking, whether or not you need to have the rounds, you know, just having people participate in the ranking is part of the success of the, of the endeavor. Right. I think even Ms. Ada mentioned that um, educating voters enough so they know that they like just voting for one candidate is not fully per not fully getting all the benefits of ranked choice voting in the ballot that allows you to rank uh, second, third, fourth, and fifth choices. Um, but I also think that for voters experiencing ranked choice voting for the first time, um, when you try out anything new, your you know your brain is wired so that when you experiencing when you're experiencing something for the first time, it's new. It's a little scary. The voters who did vote in these special elections have had that experience and they've you know overcome that hurdle of using a ranked choice ballot and what we've heard from the board of elections is that for the most part people who came in to vote those who hadn't heard of ranked choice voting hadn't received our mailings of course we can't guarantee we can reach every single voter um but those who you know entered the polling site and were encountering ranked choice voting for the first time were able to read the directions, understand what was requested of them. And even in the news articles that reported on it, they didn't really seem to think it was that big of a deal. Like it was sort of like, yeah, it was a new thing. <laughs> I tried it out, <laughs> which is I think the New York spirit in most ways. <laughs> well said, um, well said. Um, I'm gonna to turn to Jamela for her question and then we'll move into the, into the, the second half of the discussion, uh, Jamela. Thank you, Eric. Um, just wanted to piggyback on what Ali was just saying. Yeah, this is not our, our first ranked choice election. The first one was, and I mean, and some elections may never get to round two. You know, that's just the reality of it. It doesn't mean that every election will go to round five. Um, so that's some that's a message that we've also been getting to people as well. Um, but my question was actually about the um, the trained trainers and also some of the language access. So I know that. You mentioned, I forgot who mentioned it, that the VRA languages are all covered. And I really don't remember it at this moment and that includes Haitian Creole. And um, I just wanted to get a little bit more information on if there had been black immigrant groups that you've seen in the train the trainer sessions. And if so, what languages or ethnicities do you think they cover? And um, if there is a gap there, where, where do you need help in reaching some more of that community? Um, I can take this question too. This is a really good question, Jamila. Um, the four Voting Rights Act languages are Spanish, uh, Chinese, Korean, and Bengali. Uh, we've translated our voter-facing training into all four of those, and it's available free for use to anyone who wants to use them. Um, we are conducting Spanish language trainings in partnership with Naleo and Dominicanos USA in the Bronx. Um, and most of that is they are sending out and sponsoring and partnering to make sure that there's turnout for that event. As far as the demographics or the language of train the trainer attendees, we do not collect that information. And I haven't um, tried to guess at that <laughs> based on our attendees, um, but we have had questions about Russian and Polish and Haitian Creole language support. Um, the folks at Democracy NYC will be working with the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs to translate our ranked choice voting landing page into 10 additional languages. 
Um, I do not have that list off the top of my head, but if Eve wants to jump in right now, she can. <laughs> Um, and we're also hoping that since that same content that's on our landing page is also in the one page flyer that we'll be able to use that um, to offer the flyer up in those languages as well. Our friends at Rank the Vote are doing pretty significant um, outreach into, they're, they're providing community grants to um, language speaking community organizations. And I know that one of those languages is Haitian Creole. So we have been directing folks to um, reach out to rank the vote if they are looking for Haitian Creole um, trainings. Got it. So in terms of what the city is offering, um, the Civic Engagement Commission is probably going to provide that support for Haitian, because I'm, I'm not asking about a third party that's not um, city government. So that would be the Civic Engagement Commission that's going to assist in Democracy NYC for the Haitian Creole? Yes, the languages are you just posted them, Arabic, Russian, Urdu, Polish, Haitian Creole, French, Albanian, Greek, Italian, and Yiddish. So that's in addition to the five languages that we already have translated materials in. Thank you. I was asking specifically about Black immigrants, but thanks. Um, appreciate the question. Um, before moving on, I just want to, I want to recognize and welcome Danielle Girard, uh, from a member of the committee who's joined us uh, midstream. Um, welcome. Um, uh, and with that, I'm going to um, turn back to Ellie, who is pulling double duty for us tonight, um, <laughs> uh, to to sort of kick off a discussion of, um, you know, uh, proposed draft legislative agenda for um, for this legislative session in Albany. As folks who've been with the committee a bit um, remember, we publish each year a voter analysis report. Allie and her team are, are, are deep in, 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 in the preparations to in putting that report together. Um, and, um, and, and she is going to talk a little bit about uh, some of the policy ideas that, uh, that we hope to contain in that report uh, when it is presented to members of the committee and ultimately published uh, and released to the public in April. Um, and Perry Grossman from the New York Service of Civil Liberties um, is here to um, uh, to talk a bit about some of um, what's on their agenda. Uh, so with that, I will kick it over to Ali. Thank you, Eric. Um, I'm just trying to find my tab. Um, all right. Sorry, folks. Okay, so um, we have a couple of buckets that we're making recommendations for um, policy and legislative changes looking towards the future based on what we saw in the 2020 election year. Um, so the first one that we're focusing on is election administration transparency. And a lot of this is born out of the fact that um, without data in machine readable format that allows us to evaluate the impacts of voting changes, um, we can't really make recommendations that are as good as we would like them to be. So one of the examples for that is um, we saw voters use absentee ballots for the first time last year. And um, one of those innovations, so to speak, was changing the absentee ballot envelope so that it was clearer for folks that they needed to sign it. And um, the result of that we know is that there were fewer invalid absentee ballots cast, but that information is not publicly available. And we think it would be really valuable to have information like that so we could tell stories about um, the quality of the elections process and the experience of voters in that process. Um, another piece that we're going to talk about is voter registration. Um, we saw last year that the lack of online voter registration meant that registrations in New York City fell behind those of New York State. Um, and we are also focusing on the political party change date and implementation recommendations for AVR and same day, sorry, automatic voter registration and same day voter registration. Um, next up for absentee ballots, um, we know that they are here to stay, hopefully, um, because we will be passing uh, no excuse absentee balloting. Um, but for the last year, we've all kind of had that opportunity because it was opened up as um, an excuse being COVID for everyone. Um, so some really promising bills have been introduced that would speed up the counting process of absentee ballots, as we've spoken about. 
the District 31 special is going to take about two weeks to know the results of because, uh, not because of ranked choice voting, but because of the absentee ballot counting process. And we think that is hugely important to fix ahead of the RCD primary elections in June. Um, we also like some of the technology solutions that came out of 2020, which are requesting an absentee ballot online and by phone, being able to track your ballot using the application that the Board of Elections provides. Um, there's some improvements to be made, but we overall like those and want them to be available in the future. Um, so that's just a sample of those ideas. For in-person voting, we are structuring our recommendations around the 30-minute um, minimum standards poll site line requirement in state law. Um, and so what that means is instead of seeing long lines on election day in 2020, we saw them at early voting sites because a lot of the, um, the volume of voters waiting in line shifted from election day to early voting. Um, so what does that mean for early voting site selection and a ton of other ramifications that hopefully we can provide recommendations for solutions for. Um, and then the last piece that we're talking about extensively, and I think this segues well to Perry, <laughs> um, is expanding voting rights and access. So um, one, of the, one of the subjects that we're really interested in, and we've been following the, the passage of a bill in the Senate this week is rights restoration for those um, on, par uh, on parole. And um, we, would, we would recommend even taking into consideration changing the law so that like, like some other states in our union, we never remove the right to vote um, from someone who is incarcerated. Um, and we also have recommendations to make sure that poll sites remain accessible um, and that the ballot marking device that is selected probably within the next couple of years to replace the current auto mark is um, members of the disability community are consulted when that selection is made. And then last but not least, we are making recommendations related to language access. I, we've had a lot of questions about that. Um, and I think for our part at the CFB, we have recognized the importance of providing those services to voters. Um, but not only that, the New York Voting Rights Act has uh, stipulations that would require the Board of Elections to significantly expand their um, translations and interpretation services. So I will segue that to one of the main brains behind that bill, um, Perry Grossman. <laughs> Thanks, Sally. It's very kind of you. Um, you know, certainly our, our priorities square um, with a lot of the things that Allie just mentioned, because we all do try to stay in fairly close contact in this voting community. It is, it is small, but tight-knit and energetic, uh, and it is great to have uh, such wonderful partners. So thank you for, for having me here today. Um, I do want to spend most of my time talking about the New York Voting Rights Act, um, which would be the strongest and most comprehensive state voting rights act in the nation. Um, I do briefly sort of want to note um, some other priorities, not the least of which is to applaud the passage of SA30B, um, the restoration of rights automatically upon release. Um, you know, it's a, it's a critical step. It's been long overdue. I am delighted to see the Senate do it. I hope the assembly will pick it up. Um, it is A4448 on their side, um, and hopefully that gets moving soon enough. Um, certainly, we're pleased about the constitutional amendments moving to permit no excuse absentee and to permit same day registration, both critically important innovations. They need uh, implementing legislation, right? The constitutional amendment is not going to take care of everything on its own. So um, it's critical that we all stay engaged with, um, with making sure the legislature moves to, to actually implement the procedures necessary to let people um, vote from home without an, without an excuse um, and to engage in same day registration. It would be better if those were passed sooner rather than later because lag time between the passage of the constitutional amendments and, um, and the implementing legislation is just gonna leave voter confusion and, and less time for the Board of Elections to implement these reforms. I'm glad that we've had some opportunity to get socialized to no excuse absentee balloting, but it is gonna take work to get it right. And the more we do um, to, to ramp up that implementation, the better off we are. Um, 
So let me get into the New York Voting Rights Act, which I think is just like the bee's knees. Um, so it is, it is um, a bill that, that functionally exists in seven major parts. Um, you know, the, the first part is a canon of construction in the election law that favors uh, equitable access to the right to vote. So there is um, an assurance that the election law will be interpreted in a way that produces racial equity, uh, ethnic equity, um, ensures that marginalized groups have their ballots counted on the same footing. Um, there is, of course, a canon of construction that favors the voter and favors counting ballots, um, because right now there are too many ways for a voter's uh, vote to get knocked out through uh, challenge processes or judicial processes, um, and that shouldn't happen. Um, the second part of the bill is designed to mirror um, Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act, the Federal Voting Rights Act, and also to build off of the very successful California Voting Rights Act, as well as the Oregon and Washington Voting Rights Act, by providing an enhanced cause of action against racial vote dilution and vote suppression. Um, the Federal Voting Rights Act really evolved in, in judge-made law because the law was, was tremendously unspecific. If you look at Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act, it's about two sentences long. Um, you know, the, the New York Voting Rights Act, the John R. Lewis Voting Rights Act of New York, I should say, because its namesake is, of course, critical, especially in his birthday week, um, you know, provides greater legislative guidance to the courts. So there isn't as much opportunity as the federal courts have to really roll back those protections and to provide different lenses for approaching voter suppression and vote dilution, which are really cases that should be litigated in different ways using different evidence. Um, and so it acknowledged those, those important things. It also provides a way for cost-effective solutions um, through agreements so that we're able to resolve a lot of these problems um, without the time and expense of litigation. Section three, um, I, I hope is one that really gets at all the, all the data nerds here. And I know there are so many and I, I have immense fondness for you all. Um, it creates a statewide database um, of election and demographic information that can be used to make better policy. I think one of the things that I, I, I delight in most in my work with CFB and VAC and, and, and all of these wonderful folks is the way in which we understand that great policy is evidence-based. And we do the best we can to share um, you know, the data we have to create the best recommendations. And um, it's really hard to get good data. It is really hard to get the Board of Elections to respond to FOIL requests. It is really hard to make sure that we have the best stuff available all the time. And it's hard to make sure that we have good historic data available so we can observe trends in voting over time. Section three of the New York Voting Rights Act would create a statewide database housed in SUNY to which boards of elections and other election authorities in New York State, because in fact, most election authorities in New York State are not boards of elections. They are villages, they are school districts, they are other entities. And um, having to send foils to all of them is maddening. That would collect all of that data and make it publicly available so we can conduct better research and, and come up with best practices uh, that are data-driven. Um, section four are the language access provisions that Ali was alluding to. Um, certainly the Federal Voting Rights Act has created through section 203 and section 4B, you know, important thresholds for expanding access for language minority groups. But we have so much language diversity in New York State that the federal law doesn't even really begin to get us where we need to go. New York City has done some admirable work. We need more, but we really need a lot more outside of New York City as well. So um, section four expands that out. Section five attempts to mirror the crown jewel of the Voting Rights Act, the most effective civil law, uh, civil rights law in US history, which is the preclearance regime that was rendered inoperable in Shelby County v. Holder back in 2013. And what it would do is ensure that covered counties, right, counties that are identified by a formula as having particular, um, a particular history of discrimination or, or current state of, of uh, discriminatory practices would have to make sure that their changes to their election laws and practices do not make minority voters worse off. That is a non-retrogression standard that was applied well by the US Department of Justice for years. It is one that our attorney general's office can apply as well. Um, 
And hopefully this gets boards of elections and other election authorities thinking in the mold of how do we adapt our election system over time to increase equity and not backslide. Um, it's a fairly detailed provision. We've put a lot of work into it. Um, and you know, I think we're seeing some good engagement with it. Um, so that, that would be a tremendous boon and a real example that New York can set for the rest of the country. Um, section six is a voter intimidation cause of action, a civil voter intimidation, voter deception, voter obstruction cause of action. Right now, New York state law only has one cause of action against uh, voter intimidation. It is a misdemeanor, so it can only be charged by the DA's offices. We have no way for voters to take swift action to stop um, the spread of misinformation, the obstruction of polling places by you know, obnoxious campaigns and car rallies and all kinds of other things that get in the way, um, or old fashioned intimidation. So this really um, expands that out and modernizes it in a way that's patterned off of existing statutes elsewhere. Um, and last but not least, it creates an attorney fee structure that's similar to what exists in other states to incentivize its enforcement. Um, and of course, uh, the attorney general's office is, is an important player in the enforcement scheme here. And, and uh, the law really empowers that office to do more to protect voters in an efficient way. So I hope you'll all take a look at it. The bill number is S1046. I don't believe there is an assembly same as number yet. However, uh, assembly member Latrice Walker is the sponsor of the same as on the assembly side. Uh, hopefully there will be a joint hearing on the bill later this year. Um, and I expect it to provide both real benefits for, for the state of New York, but even more, uh, at least as importantly, to provide national leadership among the states on voting rights, something that New York has not done uh, historically, but is starting to do more recently. Um, and I'm, I'm proud to have you all as partners in that process. Um, I, I want to thank you for that, Perry. That was that was comprehensive and, and thorough. And 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 thank you for 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 being here to be part of this conversation. Um, you know, as, as both of you note and are, and are aware, you know, these next few months um, leading up to the state budget are going to be really crucial for us to, if, if we're going to make progress on any of these issues this year. And so, um, I want to thank you both for for this discussion. Um, and, and I want to see here um, if we have questions from members of the committee for, for Ali or Perry about, um, about the legislative session this year. I see Danielle with her hand raised, so I will look to you. Yeah, so thank you. You're both uh, so impressive and succinct, and I um, will try to be brief. Is there any move in New York City to enable people to vote wherever they are, because if it's all data driven now and everybody has the same tablets and if you work in the Bronx or live in Manhattan, it seems that you should be able to vote in the Bronx. And the reason I raise this is because in um, one of the neighborhoods uh, where we were uh, uh, running tables outside the polls, there was one site for 120,000 people to vote and people waited four hours, et cetera, et cetera. And it was my understanding that one of the reasons there were so few early voting sites in areas that are extremely heavily populated is that there were difficulties uh, getting accessible sites. So if it didn't matter where you voted, then that wouldn't be as much of a problem and you wouldn't have to wait four hours to vote. Um, so I don't know who can answer that. <laughs> I don't know if it's, it doesn't seem to be part of the bill and maybe the bill wouldn't govern how the city board of elections does what it does, but the whole thing seemed not as well organized as it could have been. I don't know if anyone else, I mean, this, you know, we flagged this issue in the letter that we sent to the board of elections um, after our hearing in the fall as, you know, making sure that the sites match, you know, because of the work that Allie and her group did, you know, showing that there were so many more people assigned to different voting sites, early voting sites. Um, so that was one of the issues we flagged. So I, and again, you know, we'll 
be talking about, I think in our last report, we recommended that they have, I am, that's terrible. The word is escaping me what that's called, you know, being able to vote wherever you are um, at the Board of Elections expand to those sites. And so, you know, hopefully there'll be some movement on that. Our, our hope is also that there's there's an obvious move towards citywide voting, um, right? The part, I mean, such a, such a ridiculous problem was people having to wait on four hour lines at an assigned site when, you know, if there was just an opportunity to move to another site, you know, traveling 15 minutes can save you three and a half hours. I think anyone would do that. So, um, you know, there, there are workarounds for that. There certainly um, has been an issue that's been identified um, by legislators. So um, I'm not sure of the current status of the legislation to, um, to amend the early voting law, um, but it, it's obvious that it's certainly borough-wide and really ultimately citywide voting are, are imperatives. Um, and I hope it happens sooner rather than later. But I guess my question is who, who gets to, does it have to be a statewide legislation? Does it have to be a decision made by the mayor? Is it a decision made by the chairs of the board of elections? Who, who makes that decision so that we could implement it? It's a decision made by the board of elections. Um, unfortunately, the early voting law leaves a little bit too much flexibility. Um, and New York City, I believe, are the only remaining counties in the state that do not offer um, countywide voting. Um, that's, that's wrong. And if they don't do it as a matter of action on the part of the board, then the state legislature should make them do it. It's, it is just inexcusable. Um, unfortunately, it is an area in which the city does not have a lot of sway. Um, certainly, I think the city could uh, attempt to litigate on behalf of, um, of its voters. That is not necessarily an opinion shared by the city law department, but I think that's true. Um, but, but, but the most important thing is, is um, you know, the Board of Elections should get its act together and make that decision. If they won't, the state legislature should take out the exception that allows them um, to not offer countywide voting. Um, you know, on the city side, what the city could do um, is, is, is help with, um, with more sites and to, to really bring in more of that weight it carries with institutions that receive tax breaks from the city um, to make sure that they're not uh, opting out of being poll sites because they just don't want to be, right? So uh, that is one area where I want to make sure the Board of Elections does not get too much flack because they have a hard time um, getting sites to work with them. And it's very, very difficult to work with a site that won't work with you. So the city can do more to help encourage more places to be early voting sites um, which is which is a good thing, right? People do not want to travel a long way to go vote. Certainly, it's, it would be great to have some massive citywide vote centers, but frankly, the more you can reduce the time and distance someone has to travel to go vote, you reduce the cost of voting. Um, and in a city where we get a lot of people who can't necessarily afford the cost of voting, we got to lower the cost of voting to meet them where they live. Thank you very much. That was great. Thank you. It's a lot of fun. <laughs> uh, any other questions from members of the committee or or folks who are with us? Um, if you are not uh, if you're not a panelist, please if if you if you'd like to chime in with a question, uh, raise your hand, uh, and and we're happy to call on you and bring you into the conversation. Going once, going twice. And uh, well, hearing none, uh, I will take this opportunity to uh, thank the folks who have joined us. I wanna thank Perry, uh, I wanna thank Eve from Democracy NYC, uh, and certainly uh, a ton of thanks to our staff who've prepared uh, to present here tonight, um, to Allie and Mitchell, and really everybody who's helped, who's helped put this program together um, for the specials and for this um, really unprecedented primary election we have come up in June. Um, uh, any, any, any concluding remarks from, from the folks here on the committee, Amy or Rick? 
No, I just wanted, I mean, I'll echo what Eric said. I think that, I mean, the, the amount of effort into going into training people and, you know, the number of seminars and programs that are going on is truly, you know, amazing considering there's also, you know, lots of other work getting ready for that election. Aside from ranked choice voting, the education, there's a lot of work being done to prepare the city for voting in uh, the municipal election in June um, with the largest number of candidates that we have ever seen um, in the history since the campaign finance board has been around. So, you know, really there's thank you to all the work and really if everybody gets up the vote to remind people that how important it is to vote in municipal elections, um, you know, that is, you know, something that is sometimes falls um, on the wayside. People hear a lot about the presidential election and forget about the municipal elections, but this is equally or if probably more important to your actual day-to-day -day life to vote in a municipal election. With that, I, I, will, I will thank everyone uh, for spending this time with us tonight um, and, and um, um, bring this meeting to a close. Uh, we'll see everybody back here uh, for our next meeting in April. Good night.